Hello, Oklahoma. David Dean here. I'm the Digital Media Manager at OETA and recently had the absolute pleasure of talking with the preeminent travel icon and PBS giant that is Rick Steves. We cover his upcoming pledge event, Rick Steves Island Hopping, airing on OETA Thursday, March 11th, and discuss everything from how the pandemic has affected travel, Rick's love for public media, and his new friend, his oven. I hope you can venture out in spirit during this conversation, and I would also like to remind you to visit OETA.TV and click Donate, as Rick can't make his shows without pledges from viewers like you. Now, let's talk with Rick. Enjoy. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start off by asking you how you are doing right now, and uh, are you at home in, uh, in Washington, and uh, what is, uh, how, how are you? Well, thank you. I, as far as somebody has to live through the pandemic lockdown, I'm, I could not be in a nicer situation. I'm blessed to have a nice house with a lot of light. Uh, right now, I'm overlooking my old uh, junior high school uh, play field. I can see the school in the distance. I can see my town, uh, the Puget Sound, the ferry just leaving the dock and going over to the Olympic Peninsula. And whenever it's uh, not cloudy, which is, you know, once in a while, I can see the Olympic Mountains. So I've got a beautiful spot. My uh, dining room table is my office. And uh, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of this. And uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a fortunate uh, uh, person who can work at home and stay safe and uh, be in touch with a lot of people digitally. Uh, and we're just trying to be patient and diligent and embrace science and take care of our neighbors. And um, we're I'm confident we're on a glide path to normalcy right now. Um, I am feeling those uh, same sentiments of hope and uh, as well. And speaking of the pandemic, how, how has it uh, affected your travels if there has been any um, over since the pandemic started almost a year now? And uh, what do you do to keep yourself sane? I mean, aside from the beautiful views that you're staring at and, uh, and yeah. to stay safe, what do you do for yourself? Well, part of my view about a six or seven minute walk downhill from me is my office. And normally we have a hundred hardworking people in that office, putting together our TV shows and our public radio show and uh, our guided tours around Europe and writing all of our guidebooks. And uh, a year ago we had to disband and now we're all operating remotely and uh, I'm keeping my team together, uh, but it's pretty quite a challenge. I've got a payroll of a hundred people and zero revenue for the last year. Um, but I'm committed to keeping the staff together. I think it's the ethical thing to do for an employer if, if that employer can has, has the capital to do it. And I think it's also a smart investment because I need my team together when we come out of this. I believe that a crisis like this, when it comes to tourism and travel, the demand does not dissipate. It just gets backed up. And when we're free to travel again, uh, people are going to be thankful that we're still standing so we can help them enjoy Europe the way we like to on a Rick Steves tour. How do you think that travel will change? And what do you think people's perceptions of travel, uh, what do you think will be the kind of the impacts from this pandemic and overseas travel and travel in particular? You know, I don't think I'm delusional, but I think it'll be essentially normal when we get out of this. And uh, there will be an interim period where people will be social distancing and they will not have capacity in the restaurants and so on. Uh, but I'm not gonna retool my business for that interim. I'm gonna assume now that we have vaccines, back when it was testing and social distancing and all that, it was whack-a-mole and you're doing good and then you're not doing good and that state's doing good and this state's not doing good and so on. But now that we're just working toward herd immunity and everybody getting vaccine, both in Europe and in the United States, I think the key for somebody in tourism like me, and you know, our, the lion's share of our revenue is from taking groups around Europe. We took 30,000 people on Rick Steves tours in 2019, it was our best year ever. And then we went down to zero last year, and then we hope to get it back up again next year. But um, I think it's going to be, um, you know, we're, we're going to be patient. There'll be an interim period where people will be going to Amsterdam and eating in a bubble so they don't get, a, you know, anybody's um, uh, virus. But um, I'm going to wait until that's passed. And then I really think that we'll be traveling pretty normal again. I mean, I go for me, the Rick Steve style of travel is the opposite of social distancing. I go to Rome to pack into those piazzas and do the passeggiata, lick in my ice cream cone. I, I go to Paris and I wanna get kissed on the cheeks when I see my old friends there. Uh, and um, I, I like to go to the bars in Ireland and clink glasses with people who really believe that strangers are just friends who've yet to meet. And, and that's the essence of good travel is people. 
And uh, we're going to have that people dimension of travel again, but it's just going to take a little patience. And if it's end of 2021 or, or um, spring of 2022, I can wait. You know, we've had 30 good years and now we got a couple of bad years. Uh, we got to take the good with the bad. And I'm in this for the long haul. Well, um, I think that's a, just a great plan and sentiment all around. And, uh, you know, you mentioned your home and that you get to walk uh, to your offices and you've been there for, you've stayed home in your entire life. Is that correct? Yeah, it is interesting. I've traveled a lot, but I can look out my window right here. Just like when I'm in my office, I look out my office and I can see my old junior high school. Um, so I think it's easier to leave home when you really like your home and you, you feel rooted. I'm very rooted here in my little town. And uh, for 30 years, I've spent 100 days a year in Europe. And uh, that's what I need to do to keep my business uh, refreshed and new and growing and, you know, updating guidebooks. And when I update guidebooks, I learn enough to take the tours around and I make enough money on the tours to help produce our TV show. And the TV show wouldn't be possible without all the friends I, I've made and experiences I've had taking groups around and working on the guidebooks. So everything works together. And um, that's, that's what I do. I, I spend 100 days a year in Europe. And then, boy, the happiest day of the year for me, along with the day I leave, is the day I come back to my little town. And then I uh, reacquaint myself with my neighbors. And um, I become the, just a guy enjoying his hometown, Edmonds. <laughs> well, that is fantastic. And uh, speaking of, uh, of your shows, and, and we'll get to um, Island Hopping Europe in a moment. But um, I, you know, I you are really a, a PBS giant. I mean, you are up there with, with Bob Ross, with Mr. Rogers. You have, I mean, you are on the, uh, the Hall of Fame for PBS. And, and I, I want to know, uh, wh why do you value public television so much? And why have you uh, made uh, this such a long-term commitment that is so uh, critical and important to uh, public television? Yeah, thank you, David. I, I really look at media as hugely influential in what shapes our point of view. Uh, it shapes the, the worldview of young people. Uh, I mean, it shapes the point of view of everybody. And um, I, I, I'm a good capitalist, and I know you have to have privately held uh, corporations and incentives to make profit and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to media, I'm so thankful there's one little oasis on the dial that is not um, uh, privately held and profit seeking. It is public and it's uh, public media, whether it's radio or TV. I, I just feel like it's important for the fabric of our community. Uh, we've learned in the last couple of years that uh, society really needs to take care of its populace. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and media, I, I like public media, radio or TV, because I can produce programming that respects people's intelligence, that assumes an attention span. And it's driven not by a passion for keeping advertisers happy, but by a passion for inspiring people to reach out and embrace the world. And our, our society is quite fearful these days. I've been at this ever since I was a kid, and that's a long time ago. And I've, I've, I've never, you know, we, we've never been more fearful as a society. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm, you know, before, after sure. COVID. What's out there? We're 4% of this planet. What about the other 96%? Uh, when I started traveling, people would say, bon voyage. Well, now they say, have a safe trip. And I know it is safer to travel today, again, apart from COVID in normal times today, than it was back when people said, bon voyage, it's safer to travel today. Statistically, it's, 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 it is safe to travel. And, uh, but people are afraid. And, and I've thought a lot about this. And, and I really believe fear is for people who don't get out very much. Um, the most frightened people in our society are the people buried deep in the middle of it without passports, whose worldview is shaped by commercial media commercial news. And the flip side of fear is understanding. And we gain understanding when we travel. So for me, my mission as a, uh, as a, just a good citizen, uh, a hardworking person who cares about his community, who, who loves America, is to get out there and actually learn more about my own home and my own homeland by leaving it and looking at it from a distance and then coming home and, uh, and um, sharing what I learned. I, I feel like I'm a little bit like the medieval jester, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, the king paid the jester to be annoying. He sent him, he gave him room and board and he sent him out into the barrio to learn what the, what the peasants were complaining about and who's telling jokes about who. And then the jester would come back into the castle and tell the king what's going on outside. Uh, in a way, I see the role of a travel writer today doing that. And I'm so thankful for public broadcasting to give me a platform to go to places that are easy to misunderstand and then to come home and share that, what I've learned with our, with our audience. So I was just in Ethiopia and Guatemala producing a one hour special on 
hunger and hope and the value and importance of um, development aid and uh, rich world helping out the poor world, not because we love our neighbor necessarily, but because it's just a smart investment to make our, make our world more stable and safe. Um, you know, that was a great uh, mission for me as a TV producer and a travel teacher. And I'm thankful I had public broadcasting to let me share that. Uh, you know, I went to the Holy Land and, and uh, tried to share both narratives on either side of the wall that separates Palestine and Israel. Well, some people didn't want me to say that, but, uh, you know, we have to get out there and learn what, is the, what are both narratives. I went to Iran with my TV crew and came home and, and did what I could to humanize 70 million Iranians. I wasn't trying to make apologies for them for bad things their government has done, but I did want to remind us that there's a lot of good people in Iran and, and uh, they've got their own baggage just like we have our own baggage. And thanks to public broadcasting, which is committed to challenging us to reach out and, 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 and get to know the rest of the world, Thanks to public broadcasting, I was able to share that. And so that's why I'm, I'm very committed to public broadcasting. I, a lot of times when I'm on the, on the pledge circuit, you know, I just say I'm a soldier for public broadcasting. This is important for the fabric of our democracy. It's never been more important than right now. And if it really, if public broadcasting angers certain uh, dimensions in our society, you, you wonder why, why does it, why does it threaten people? Do, do, do people, are people really threatened by, Frontline and Rick Steves and Fred Rogers, or uh, are they just uh, afraid of reaching out? So I love my gig with public broadcasting. I'm thankful for it. And I'm thankful that citizens all across our country recognize the value of public broadcasting. And when they do, they know when we have a pledge drive, it's, it's kind of a celebration because that means we have quality media, media that's shaping the outlook of our next generation that's driven not by the advertisers, but that's driven just by reaching out and, and celebrating the world in all of its diversity. Uh, extremely well said. And uh, as someone who worked in uh, kind of larger media companies uh, myself uh, earlier in my career, I have never been more proud and, uh, and happy to be working for, for PBS. Yeah. For, uh, it, it's just, it, it's a completely different kind of pride um, to have working in public media. And um, it's really a, a really amazing thing. And David, it's not a matter of, oh, you know, commercial media is bad. Commercial media is great. I love it. But there needs to be that one little oasis on the dial that doesn't see us as eyeballs on some ratings chart, but that sees us as neighbors and fellow citizens. And I, I just I just am so enthusiastic about that. And part of it is I just appreciate, you know, um, the economics and the impact of public media. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I think um, it's very important when we do have... Uh, membership season and pledge drives and so on, that we don't just um, sell station mugs and t-shirts, but that we um, use that opportunity to remind people just of the importance of, of media and the importance of having, again, that one little oasis on the dial that respects our intelligence and, and helps us to be positive and not fearful. Um, absolutely. And I'm going to get directly into uh, to pledge and your show, but I have one other question that just kind of follows up on what you're talking about, but I'm curious what I value a lot in uh, in culture and in reading, and um, and you know not not just your basic uh, education, which is important as well. But how do you think traveling and seeing other cultures, and if this is too political, you don't have to answer it. But how do you think it can help us have a better understanding of the current divide in our nation and and what we're seeing? Um, mm -hmm. If we were maybe more cultured or more open to seeing um, maybe the bigger picture, meaning you know, on a global level, maybe, and, and seeing that it's, if, if you see where I'm going, yeah. Yeah, I see where you're going for sure. And uh, the great thing about travel is it gives us empathy for people we might not understand. If we could all travel and get to know each other, I, I think that would be the, the biggest step we could take in, in uh, weaving our, our divided society back together. I mean, when you look at societies that really have a tough time, they've got they've got conditions that keep their young people from knowing each other. In Israel, in the Holy Land, with Palestine, they built a wall to protect uh, Israel from the terrorists. Okay, that's fine. But the unintended consequence of that wall is it keeps the younger generation unable to talk to each other, and then they are saddled only by their parents' baggage. And that's heartbreaking. And uh, when people can get together, 
then they realize, hey, we've got a lot of reason to work together, and uh, we've got more in common than 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 not. Um, in in uh, Ireland, they've done a great job of bringing that uh, troubled island together after all the troubles they've had between the Catholic and the Protestant communities. And the government actually worked to have summer camps where the Protestant kids and the Catholic kids would 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 go camping together, and they'd they'd dance together, and they'd tell stories together. And it was just a great success. In Europe, even in tough economic times in Europe, they've got something called the Erasmus program. And this funds teachers and students to work and study in other countries in the European Union. You know, there's 300, 400 million people in the European Union, and they're traveling all over the place and studying and working together. And it's a, it seems like an idealistic thing, but no, it's a practical investment on having that society respect and understand each other better. In one of our TV shows, we were going to a fraternity house for a, a party one evening in Portugal. And I thought I would just see a bunch of Portuguese kids there, but it was a, a whole festival of kids from all over the European Union. There were Danes, there were Irish, there were Czech, there were Greek, there were and Spanish and Portuguese kids all together. And I just love that Erasmus program. And uh, here in our country, it's so important that we don't just live in our own little echo chambers, but that we get out and get to know that hey, we're all good people. And we've got different life stories. We've got different um, baggage. We've got different uh, outlooks. And, uh, and uh, we don't all need to agree on everything, but uh, it sure makes sense to try to figure it out. Uh, so travel is, travel is really, um, it's a huge investment on bringing a society together in so many ways. I see it as America and the rest of the world. I mean, that's kind of what my mission is. I always joke, you know, our mission at Rick Steves Europe, where I employ 100 people here just north of Seattle, is to equip and inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. And uh, I say that with a little bit of a joke, but for so many Americans, their idea of travel is going to Orlando. They'll go to Disney World 20 times before they'd ever go to Portugal. And, uh, you know, Portugal won't bite you. Morocco won't bite you. Norway won't bite you. Hang out with people who might challenge your ethnocentricity. Imagine hanging out with Norwegians. Imagine hanging out with Spaniards who don't have the American work ethic. Hanging out with Danes who like to pay taxes and they have high expectations and they see that as a practical and good investment. Uh, you know, hang out with Turks who are not living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and, and see what it's like to live in Turkey for a little while uh, and the challenges of, sep of, um, of maintaining a, a separation of mosque and state, just like we try to maintain a separation of church and state. Uh, these are all very stimulating opportunities for anybody who travels. And then you can realize the value of having that broader perspective. A lot of people are afraid of culture shock. You know, For me, culture shock is a great thing. It's the, it's the growing pains of a broadening perspective. And for me, the most beautiful souvenir is taking home that broader perspective. And then you become a better citizen of the planet as well as a happier and more appreciative American. And that's something I'm really thankful to do with my radio shows on public radio and with my TV show on public television is to help Americans travel vicariously and enjoy the value of that travel so that they can have that broader perspective. It just carbonates your life in a beautiful way. It does. I would say one of the years, uh, the most educational year of my life would have been 21 living with a bunch of Australians and New Zealanders and uh, and people from all over that area in, dorm, in a dorm room like setting for a year. And uh, I think yeah. I learned the most yeah. about the world that year than I did any at any point in college or any other point in my life. And uh, so I couldn't you know, agree. David, and, and that lesson stays with you all your life. You know, a lot of kids do their foreign study and some people say, well, it's just kind of a glorified trip. You know, you're not really uh, spending a lot of time in the classroom when you're going to school in France or, or Greece or, or wherever. Uh, but you're having those living, living in another cultural experiences, which really enrich your life in a way. And I just, I feel like it's kind of a goofy idea, but I think if the world wanted to make a very practical investment, they would pool their resources and give every American after graduating from school uh, a one month trip to some foreign country that was not Cancun or, or um, you know, some party zone and really have a chance to get out of their comfort zone and realize the world's not a pyramid with the United States on top and everybody else trying to figure it out. You know, everybody's got their own dreams and it's fun to celebrate that. Absolutely. And uh, I do want to mention now just talking about uh, 
Rick Steves Island Hopping Europe. It is airing on OETA on Thursday, March 11th at 1130 p.m. and Sunday, March 14th at 530 p.m. And this is a pledge show. And can you tell us a little bit about um, Island Hopping Europe and what you uh, maybe some of the um, I always like the to ask the question, what was your rose and thorn? Did you uh, what was your favorite part about um, that? And what was uh, one of the maybe not as enjoyable parts about um, the, that experience? Well, thank you, David. And I, I wanted to put together a show that would actually, I, I wanted to help out programmers because when you have, um, when you're dealing with the TV programming, a lot of times you have a 90 minute show. And then the question is, what are you going to put in that half hour slot, especially during membership time? And I wanted to make a pledge show that would be really strong on inspiration that would explain the value of public broadcasting and why it is just, it, it's, it's not a charity, it's a service. And if you're consuming the service, if you're enjoying OETA, it's just it's just right to help pay for it. If, and, and the cool thing is, if you can't afford to pay for it, that's okay. It's public. It's for everybody. But if you're consuming the service, if you're enjoying it and you can't afford to help out, it's only right to do so. And if everybody just helped out a little bit, OETA would be stronger and we'd all be better off for it. So I gathered together 20 minutes of um, my favorite island experiences and put it together in this half hour um, pledge special. And I went to my four favorite, uh, four of my favorite islands, two in the Mediterranean and then two in the North Atlantic around England. So we go to Capri and Capri is, has been a popular destination spot for vacationing uh, people ever since Roman times. The Roman emperor had a vacation getaway on Capri. And then uh, we went to Malta and Malta has been a fortified strategic island halfway between Italy and Africa uh, for centuries. Uh, and it's, it's a, a amazing crusader kind of fortress in the middle of the Mediterranean with its own culture. And uh, it used to be a British colony. So there's a lot of British phone booths and British cuisine and British accents. But at the same time, it has its own indigenous culture that goes way, way back. And there are ancient sites on Malta that are as old as the pyramids. I mean, it's incredible to see those. And then we voyage up to Scotland and uh, Scotland's just got wonderful islands. And when you're on the islands, you're just away from the mainstream. And one of the most beautiful, enchanting islands anywhere is the Isle of Skye. It just sounds nice to say the Isle of Skye. Absolutely. And uh, I just love sharing my love of the Isle of Skye on television. And then we went to Orkney. And what do you know about Orkney? I mean, I didn't know anything about Orkney until I went there. And I know how to just, pronounce it correctly now. <laughs> Orkney, yeah, that's right. But Orkney is kind of half Norwegian culture and half Scottish culture. And uh, it's just an hour north of Scottish mainland. And uh, it's a windblown island. There's almost no trees on it. It's got all sorts of fascinating ancient or prehistoric history. And it also has some amazing World War II history. It was a very strategic place in World War II. And it's got just a rough and tumble local um, population that's um, making its living off of the sea. And to, to weave those four islands together into a, a little show for public television, it was a real joy for me. And I hope it inspires people to remember that public television is a treasure. And if you want to be a, a good citizen about it and, um, and a, I'd say an ethical consumer, if you can afford to help out, it's only right to do so. And then, of course, we make it more fun and easy to help out because we have all sorts of cool travel gifts. Yes. Um, I've got a couple of my newest. My, I wrote two books last year or in 2019. Um, I just uh, I, I locked myself down before I knew there was going to be a lockdown. So I wrote my Europe's 100 Greatest Masterpieces art book a coffee table book featuring my favorite pieces of art around Europe. And then I wrote a book, a 400 page book, which is a collection of a hundred essays, my, you know, sort of showcasing my favorite experiences of a lifetime of traveling in Europe. And uh, I didn't realize it, but uh, then the next year, as soon as the books come out, we, we have to stop traveling and we're in this COVID time. And these are perfect books for any traveler that's got a little cabin fever and wants to have a, a fun book to, to stoke their traveler's spirit and scratch those travel travel bug bites you know? so that's for the love of europe and uh 100 masterpieces book um and those are my newest books and they are thank you gifts for people supporting oeta during that pledge drive well those are wonderful thank you gifts and not only uh does it help support um oeta but it also i think gives hope and uh, excitement for the people watching him to get out and explore the world again themselves and uh your books have been a staple in our household. Uh, I mean, literally since I've been growing up. I mean, my parents have gone on your have gone on your trips. I think three times. Uh, just uh, amazing things. Just what you provide is is so fantastic. And uh, I I know we're running out of time here, but I want to. I, I just have two or one quick question that I thought would be kind of fun to end it on. But I there's so many quotes of yours that I could just go on and on about. Um, but one that I really love and that I think is 
very apt for our time is right now we can venture out in spirit and uh and what do what what does that mean to you in a sense that uh until we we are nearing that normalcy and uh and we have hope for that normalcy but what does venturing out in spirit mean to you you know um i've been it's interesting i've i've had more um media interest in me more interviews magazine articles you know um uh, all sorts of things on tv and so on uh, since i've not been traveling people want to check in with the the traveler and see well what's it like when you can't travel so they're visiting the travel guy who's stuck at his home in a little town north of seattle and um i've been talking i've been developing this sort of mindset it's a life skill of being a good traveler while locked down at home and it's employing the traveler's mindset right here and um, it makes a lot of sense. If, if people go to my, my uh, website at ricksteves.com or my Facebook page, Rick Steves, they can read about a lot of these sort of things that I've been playing around with in, in the interviews and so on. But, you know, a, a good traveler is positive. A good traveler uh, is interested in getting out of his or her comfort zone uh, and uh, broadening their horizons and doing new things and, and uh, happily making mistakes and learning from them. And, uh, you know, I'm 65 years old and I've done nothing but focus on my travels all my life. And I've never learned how to cook and I've never walked a dog. And uh, I, I've in this last year, I've become a quite avid cook and I've fallen in love with a couple of dogs, my partner's dogs. And uh, I realized I, you know, I, I won't even tell you what I thought about people who walked dogs until this last year. I just thought, what a what a loser. But now I realize I was the fool. And um, it, there's a reason that people love their dogs and their cats. And there's a reason that people put on an apron and enjoy cooking and shopping and chopping and dicing. And I had never even turned on my oven, uh, I don't think, in the eight years I've lived in this house until this last year. And now I'm good friends with my oven. And I, I, uh, I just enjoy that. So I'm really thankful that because of COVID, I've uh, I've employed that traveler's curiosity and that willingness to make mistakes and try new things. And uh, I'm still wired to be a traveler. The other day I was walking home uh, and I saw a, a snail on my neighbor's fence and all I could think was escargot. But um, <laughs> I'm I'm being really patient now and I'm uh, I'm staying positive and I know more much more important than my bottom line as a businessman or my travel dreams as a traveler is uh, dealing with this pandemic right now and making sure that. Uh, people who are less privileged than me are, are are being taken care of and that we look out for our neighbors, that we embrace science, that we recognize the, the importance of, of good governance and the fragility of our environment. It's all tied together. And I hope and pray we come out of this COVID time with a mindset where we're really more enthusiastic about building bridges to the rest of the world instead of building walls to protect us from it. And uh, that will make us all safer and happier very very well said and i just want to remind everyone uh listening or that is reading this that uh rick steves europe and rick steves island hopping europe these do not happen without your donations and so to continue to see rick steves and all of the other amazing uh public uh television um, public broadcasting service programs the donations help that's why we have the pledge drives and uh, what better way um, to pledge than watching this show and receiving uh, one of Rick's books. Rick, um, I just, you are an absolute pleasure. You are such positive energy and I love that I've just been able to have you in my life for so long and uh, been able to go virtually and, uh, and read your books over the last year that has made my mind feel like I've been able to travel even though my body hasn't been able to. So uh, mm. I, I thank you so much for that. And I thank you so much for taking the time. And if there's anything else uh, you'd like to add, um, please feel free. Well, thank you, David. And uh, I, I guess I'd like to add is I feel like we're all on the same team when it comes to public broadcasting. It's it's so important for our society. And uh, I know that your team at OET is working hard and doing great work as a, as a person who's just kind of evangelical about helping Americans get out and embrace the world. I'm so thankful I found my niche because my shows would never see the light of day anywhere else on the dial. I belong in public broadcasting. And I know that our listeners who, who understand the, the, the value of this will recognize that it is flat out good citizenship to be sure that we have strong public broadcasting radio and TV in our communities and, and, and Oklahoma deserves that just like my home state of Washington. And we're all in this together. So thank you so much, David. It was great talking to you. And like I say on all my TV shows, um, happy travels. And I'll add, even if we're just staying home for a while. Absolutely, Rick. <laughs> thank you so much.